Today on Quest, my guest is Bulgarian teenage astronaut in training, Tatiana Ivanova. I think you'll really enjoy this podcast. Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hi everyone, I'm your host, Todd Fisher, and welcome to Season 3 of Quest. A quest is a search for something, and this podcast will show you how we know what we know through interviews with people that have incredible stories of dedication and perseverance. To me, curiosity is part of what makes us human, and there's still so much we don't know. There's joy in discovery. It's what drives us. It's our quest. Hi, Tatiana. Welcome to the Quest Podcast. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I am excited to have you as a guest. You are so inspirational to me. Like, I just was really surprised. I came across your Instagram page. And uh, I was like, who is this, you know, Bulgarian teen astronaut in training? Like, what is this? You know, so I'm, I'm really kind of a, a really a huge fan of space and exploration. And when I was younger, I wanted to be an astronaut myself. And, um, and I was like, wow, this, this person is really interesting. And the more I started to look into you, I, I looked at all the things you've achieved <laughs> by the time <laughs> you were ever even 18 years old. And at the time of us recording this podcast, you're actually 19 now. Yeah. But I just, just the, some of the, just the footnotes for the listeners right now. Um, you published a book by the time you were 14 about poetry. Yeah. So you're a writer, yes. you scuba dive, you skydive, you're a dancer, you play drums, and you want to be an astronaut. And you've gone to space camp in two different countries. It's incredible. All of this is totally incredible. I just, I realize how little I had done <laughs> before the time I was 18 compared to you. So super fascinating. I wanted you to come on and talk about this stuff. So I guess my first question is, you know, when did you have an interest in space? How far back does this go that you wanted to be an astronaut? Yeah. So actually, um, as I said in our previous conversation, I grew up as, a, as an art artist. So I played the drums, you know, I read poetry, I danced for 10 years. But when I was 15, I found about the space camp in Turkey, um, which is in Asia. But I'm from Bulgaria and Bulgaria is pretty close to Turkey. So we have an official coordinator here in Bulgaria. And uh, I applied for a scholarship. I actually won a full scholarship on my second try. And um, in the summer of 2018, I managed to go to the space camp in Turkey. So my, let's say, dream, um, you know, sparked in my heart <laughs> um, when I was 15, when I was at the space camp, we watched a movie about an astronaut that was climbing on rocks uh, on the one of the moons of Jupiter, you know, Europa, that's uh, how it's called. Yeah. So yeah, those mom at this moment, I realized that I really want to become an astronaut and become scientist and leave my footprint here on Earth. And not only on Earth, let's say on the moon, on Mars. I really want to do great things and help my generation. Well, certainly, there is a lot of emphasis these days on kind of the Mars generation of kids out there that, you know, right now, people your age, this is the generation that everyone's looking at as the first people to potentially settle on Mars, even. It's really fascinating. So for people that aren't clear, so in the United States, we have NASA and yeah. Europe has European Space Agency. Yeah. Now, is the space camp you went to in Turkey, is that run by 
um, ESA or is that run by NASA? It's run by NASA just because in the past there were a few space camps, but right, right now there are only two because uh, they have a special license for it. Sure. And until 2019, there was a space camp in Canada as well. But right now there are only two in Huntsville, Alabama, USA, and in Izmir, Turkey. So it's an official NASA space camp and uh, there are many scientists and engineers who travel to Turkey and to the States, as well as astronauts. And uh, that's how the kids can talk in person or, you know, uh, via video chats with great people from NASA. Now, also, kind of school me on this. Now, the Russians, they have their own thing separate than ESA and and do the Japanese, do the Chinese, are theirs are all separate as well? They're not part of the ESA? Um, yeah, so uh, probably you know that there is uh, an European Union and there are 22 uh, member countries in uh, the European Space Agency. Unfortunately, Bulgaria is not an official member, which means that we cannot have an astronaut. We have uh, two cosmonauts, Georgi Ivanov and Alexander Alexander but uh, they went to space uh, in the 20th century. So they went with Roscosmos. And um, Russia has Roscosmos, Japan has JAXA, you know, in the States, uh, there are SpaceX, NASA, and many other private companies, agencies. But uh, yeah, ESA includes mainly, I think, only countries that are in Europe. Sure, yeah. Now, when I was growing up, um, the traditional way to become an astronaut in the United States was to join the Air Force, and then people from the Air Force generally would migrate over to the space program. Today, it's not so much like that anymore. Um, in fact, there's a, a huge push for civilians in the space, which we're seeing more and more and more of. So there have been a lot of civilian contractors that have gone up on you know, NASA space flights, as well as just the privatization of, mm -hmm. of space. So what do you think about private companies getting into, uh, going into space, whether it's space tourism or, you know, putting military satellites up or trying to go to Mars? I think most of us here in America think of, you know, Blue Origin, which is, you know, Amazon, Jeff Bezos thing. That's, there's Virgin Galactic, there's SpaceX. How do you feel about that? Should, should uh, space travel be government controlled or do you think the private sector getting involved is a good idea? Well, I think that uh, those both, uh, both ways are beneficial. When you send people to space, um, let's say with NASA or ESA, Roscosmos, they usually are astronauts that have a mission, uh, have uh, an experiment or research, uh, to perform there and um, those kind of missions are very be beneficial for the earth for um, our life here on earth basically when you send astronauts in space uh, they sometimes let's say predict storms hurricanes in this way many people on earth are warned and evacuated but when you send people with a private agency, um, you somehow make it more um, like the access is more easy to space because there are many people out there who are prepared but uh, are not part of the military. I mean, they're not pilots or scientists, but they they're prepared physically. So. I think that let's say SpaceX is the future of uh, the, all of the missions, and I think I think that Elon Musk is probably the uh, most prepared person to send other people to Mars. Yeah, that's why I think that uh, those uh, both ways are beneficial. For example, um, two months ago I met uh, the CEO of Axiom, which is uh, a new space agency that's a private agency and even though it's a private agency uh, one of the astronauts 
is uh, a retired NASA astronaut. So um, it's not only, you know, citizens in space all the time. Even though that uh, space tourism is going to probably be something normal in the future, yeah. I think uh, yeah. that NASA and uh, I mean, I really hope that uh, astronauts will be still, you know, looked like something uh, serious, something that you can dream to be one day. Sure, sure. To become. There are a lot of people that complain about space tourism in terms of like the carbon footprint, how much we pollute by being able to send people into kind of the lowest level of the atmosphere just to get a peek, you know, like, yeah. is that worth it? You know, there's that old saying, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze? <laughs> and, uh, and that's, that's kind of interesting to me because I see missions for science, you know, mm -hmm. I see missions for exploration, but to me it's a little ludicrous to just to go up as high as you can go because you have the money and can afford it and especially today with climate change and the world polluted as badly as it is whether that's necessary does that make sense yeah well i heard that uh, there is a famous actor who's going to space to shoot in a movie yeah, you know, Tom Cruise. Space. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I find it like, you know, that's the first step. That's our future. We we have to grow and, uh, you know, expand our, let's say, boundaries and um, goals. But I'm still kind of not okay about it because I think that in space we we should make experiments and moreover yeah the pollution is a big problem because sometimes uh, the space uh, debris and the uh, you know junk uh, goes to the earth's atmosphere and becomes dangerous for yeah. us you are absolutely right like it, it is it is probably going to become a norm because if you like think back at early airplane travel only really the rich were flying when airplanes were new and becoming commercial mm -hmm. um and then and now everyone flies and you can practically fly anywhere you know in the u.s for the cost of a bus ticket almost <laughs> it's so inexpensive to fly and uh, and you know you're probably right that this is this is the future. This is what we're headed to. And if people are surprised by what's happening, they just need to look back historically that this is what's always been happening. Even happened with automobiles. You go back to the first people having automobiles were really kind of the ultra rich of their day, and now it's commonplace for everyone to have an automobile. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to say that I really uh, don't matter sending people just, uh, you know, to be tourists in space, but about the problem with the, uh, you know, let's say um, old satellites that uh, crashed and uh, other parts, materials, etc. we still um, haven't solved the problem with the uh, space uh, debris and uh, the space, you know, trash, junk. Uh, so if we solve this problem, yeah, it will be normal to send people to space uh, every day when we want. But right now, I think that it's better to find solutions for the problems that we somehow manage to create. For sure, for sure. Right now you're in, uh, you're in university. And you're pursuing yeah. physics. Yeah. So you're in your first year of college now? Yeah, yeah. So tell me, what do you think for young listeners out there, what do you think they need to prepare themselves to move toward, you know, doing what you do to become an astronaut or want to go into space? Are there certain classes that you would recommend people should start when they're young? Um, yeah. For example, um, I don't think that university is that important. I mean, yeah, you need your degrees and it, you, you probably have to become a doctor, you know, you need your PhD. But the most important thing is to do it with passion. And um, 
yeah, it's important to be an engineer or scientist or pilot to become an astronaut just because you can be, let's say, an artist or dancer in space. You must do something when you're out there, you know. Um, but the most important things are learning new languages because when you're, let, let's say, on board the International Space Station, uh, you'll probably be with um, people that are not from your country, that don't speak your language. So learning English, Russian, Chinese, Spanish will be essential. Also, there are analog missions that prepare you for the real world, you know, uh, above the camera's wine when you go to space. Uh, so there are analog missions on the Hawaii main island, also in Poland, Switzerland. Uh, I'm going to work with Project Possum in uh, Florida in February. Um, so all of these things that I just mentioned are programs that prepare you uh, not only physically, but also uh, prepare your psyche for space. And uh, you need scuba diving certification. You must be a professional. Also, you need a pilot license for a single engine airplane if you're not you know, a military pilot. Also, you need uh, to be a professional skydiver just because sometimes um, you must... Um, use your plan B and I think that's uh, that was necessary when we sent uh, Yuri Gagarin to space just because uh, the rockets were you know not that uh, modern right now um, the technology is uh, growing developing but yeah you need to sky you need to be a skydiver scuba diver um, and that's why I'm going to get those certifications just because I really want to become the best candidate when the selection is here. Yeah. Have you started getting your pilot's license? No, I had the opportunity to operate a single engine airplane, but last week I underwent a special medical examinations so i actually am perfectly fine i got my medical uh pilot's license um since i'm living in bulgaria and i'm from bulgaria my opportunities are not that many also the financial side of the things uh is always a problem for me because when you're in the states uh you're more you can travel easily to the other states, but when you're in Bulgaria, first of all, when I, when I went to the States, I was 16, so I traveled alone. I traveled to other continents alone. I changed three airplanes, and um, I have a sister. I don't come from a wealthy family, from a rich family, and uh, it was really hard for me in the beginning because I didn't have people to support me or sponsors. Right now, I do have sponsors that give me money for those camps and for the trainings I really want to go through, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I think that the first step for me right now is to uh, get my certification from Project Possum. And after that, I'm going to focus on my skydiving certification. Yeah, yeah. And probably the summer scuba diving. Ah, that'll be fun. How many languages do you speak? Well, I speak Bulgarian and English, but I also study Russian and Spanish. Um, actually, I studied Russian for four years. And uh, when I was in 11th grade, in my junior year, I changed schools and I had to catch up with three years of Spanish. So I know a little bit of Spanish, but I'm going to join a course of Russians because I really want to get my uh, C1, I, I want the highest level uh, available. I really want to become a fluent uh, speaker in Russian. Yeah. And I imagine science and mathematics are also important classes for people to take yeah. um, to move well, forward with something like this. Yeah. Yeah, it's really important because sometimes there are risky situations um, where you can't um, 
use your computer or sometimes uh, you don't have connection and you can't call the mission control and you have to just sit down and um, you know work with uh, your knowledge uh, that happened I think with Apollo 13. Uh, so yeah, I'm as you said, I'm a freshman in college. So I study engineering physics right now. I have only me uh, mechanics, but I also study um, computer analysis of experimental data, as well as mathematical analysis and linear algebra and geometry. So it's kind of fun. Actually, the math is really, really hard. I'm going to have my exams in January and I'm studying hard right now <laughs> for them because uh, in school, we don't study calculus, which is something that you study in the States. Yeah, It's not included in our system here. And it, it's really hard to catch up with the material when you go to university. I see, I see. Tell me about the Space Quiz World Cup. Um, yeah, so that's a competition that was organized last year um, by a special center for aspiring astronauts in India. So I remember that many countries actually took part in this. It was like one month uh, long because uh, there were many rounds, you know. And um, the first round was very easy. It was not only about... Um, you know, astronomy, physics, etc. It was also about uh, authors that write about science. For example, Carl Sagan. And I, I uh, made some mistakes. I really I didn't expect to go to the next round, but I somehow managed to do it. And I don't know how, but I won the whole competition. I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, the rounds, uh, weren't that hard but uh, they weren't that easy as well I just uh, am really curious about space and that's why you know I was prepared for it but the last round I think it was three hours and even though it was online everyone could join the competition and see how the um, you know competitors uh, managed to answer the questions and yeah, I won the competition. I'm still waiting for my award, by the way, because <laughs> when uh, I won this competition, we were in a pandemic and uh, the post offices in India are closed. So they are not, uh, they cannot send me the award right now. Wow. They're waiting for the international offices to open so sure. they can send me the award. Well, yes. You know you've won, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I received my certificate, but uh, I really want to see it, you know, in person. It's uh, more sentimental when you have it. Well, congratulations on that. So Thank you. Um, wh what is the We Are Mars outreach team? And you're also an ambassador for the Mars Generation. Tell me about these organizations and what, what they're about. Yeah, so the Mars Generation is a very, very famous organization. It's, uh, it was founded by Abigail Harrison. Uh, she's actually, I think she studies in Harvard right now. Uh, she is one of the potential candidates that may be selected by NASA. Um, she and Alicia Carson as well. Uh, those two girls are very famous in the States. Uh, so the Mars Generation, that's a special foundation about kids everywhere in the world, uh, no matter or where they live. Uh, so basically we have different events, uh, we have t-shirts and our main goal is to inspire kids all over the planet, um, not only in the space area, but also um, you just have to be really passionate about your dream in order to succeed in, you know, making it come true. I mean, uh, you have to make the impossible possible. And that's uh, our motto. So yeah, I'm just an ambassador. I represent the Mars generation. Everyone can become a member. But about the uh, We Are Mars outreach team, last year there was a competition and I really wanted to become part of the outreach team. Basically, 
we started, we uh, made different um, events. For example, we shared different stories where uh, we had uh, educational quizzes. Um, my part is to write different emails to astronauts, scientists. Uh, also, we have competition, we have designers. Um, and so we really want to grow uh, this kind of a network to become something, you know, big. It was also founded by an American girl uh, and that was her passion project for university. I see, I see. It's all interesting. This is also fascinating. I wish this stuff was around when I was when I was young to be part of st stuff like this. This is just amazing to me. Yeah, well, it's related to space, but it's not uh, something that uh, you know you practice. That's uh, more of a leadership thing. Sure. A couple. Uh, well, you know, uh, let's let's dive into Mars a little bit more. So, do you think that we'll be living on Mars? I often wonder if the first humans that make it to Mars, if that's just simply a one-way trip for them. I mean, there can't possibly be a way back yeah. for those people. The first ones are going to die on the planet. But do you see us actually colonizing Mars? Or is this something that, you know, maybe we're just going to observe, land on it. It'll be like the moon. It'll become something where we just move on. What do you think? Well, I don't look at it as uh, something that uh, is related to, let's say, science fiction. I really think that we are uh, on the edge of colonizing Mars just because in the past we sent humans uh, on the moon, to the moon. And we can do it right now as well, but we focus on the International Space Station because we wanted to benefit to planet Earth. Right now, we are ready to go to the moon again with our next... Uh, missions, you know, NASA is preparing the Artemis. I think that the first um, mission, but not with uh, people, um, is uh, going to be launched in February, on the 12th of February, actually. Um, so going to Mars, exploring Mars, yeah, it would be hard, probably it would be uh, a one-way mission and people will die on the planet. Um, just because uh, the rockets are not invented. We need uh, a breakthrough in the technology. And um, Mars is a planet that is in the habitable zone. So the temperatures are pretty similar to those on Earth. You can imagine that there are people living in the in deserts and also there are people living uh, in snow in Russia. Uh, in, in Antarctica. And um, I think the biggest problem is the radiation on Mars, uh, just because uh, if we go there, we will probably have to live in caves to protect from the radiation. Um, so I think that's the main problem. We have to think about um, invention that will protect us from the space debris and the radiation. That's yeah. why we're the colonization is something very hard. But if we go there for a short term, I think it won't be a problem. Do you think that we should be on the moon first before we go to Mars? Doesn't it seem like logically a space station, a base on Mars, that these are great jumping off platforms before we go to another planet or is just Mars the next phase? Is it not necessary? To? Yeah. No, um, I heard that there is a special um, case where the rocket to Mars will be launched from the moon just because the gravity on the moon is one sixth of the gravity on Earth. And it will, it will be more, it will be easier to launch a rocket from the moon than from the earth. Um, I think that um, going to the moon again will be our first and main goal, um, just because we haven't sent people to the moon from the last century. And um, there are many things that are out there. We have to learn many things as well. Mm, and we have to check our technology, our new rockets, our astronauts, because we still 
haven't seen people for that long, you know, in space. Sure. I mean, you, there you, are missions. Yep. Yeah. Oh, don't go ahead and finish what you were going to say. I didn't mean to cut you off. There are people that uh, have um, have been on the ISIS for a year, but uh, traveling around one year to Mars, then staying on Mars, they're somehow managing to return to Earth. Well, you have to be very prepared mentally and physically for this. Sure. Well, you must be fearless to want to do these things because, you know, skydiving alone would be too much for most people. Scuba diving would be, you know, too much for most people. You know, if, to, to think about mm. being deeply underwater is incredibly claustrophobic when you jump from a height is you know scary to know you're going to be in a rocket <laughs> is scary to go to a planet that does yeah. keep sustain life like you have to be i've met a lot of astronauts particularly astronauts from like the space shuttle program or people mm, that i've met pretty. through the years um but there is one common thing with them is that they're they're fearless and uh, and you are fearless <laughs> for sure but let me oh, ask you if you could yeah. go to, if you were going to go, if you were going to put you on a rocket tomorrow to Mars, how nervous would you be? I I would go to this rocket on 100% just because, yeah, I'm fearless, but I realized something this year when I scuba dived. I mean, when I jumped out of the plane, I, yeah, I was with an instructor because it was my first time. I wasn't scared at all. I, I felt very freely i was um just enjoying my time there but when i scuba dived on five or six meters that's not that much for you know diving i i thought i would drown just because my face mask um there was water in it and even though i wasn't supposed to breathe with my nose i was supposed to breathe with my mouth i was very scared that i will uh drown down in the water and i yeah felt claustrophobic for a moment i i was scared for a moment but i think that living your life to the fullest you know um going beyond your limits is something that uh you should aim for because some yeah you will die one day and it will be more I don't know how to say it. You'll be more pleased if you die on a planet that's not Earth and you won't regret it. I, I think that's, yeah, it will be best. Yeah, well, that's a beautiful way to look at it. I love that. A couple of quick questions for you. If you, do you have a favorite Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, SpaceX, NASA, who's your, who's your favorite right now? Who's got the best tech? Who's doing the coolest thing? I think it's SpaceX. I am not a keen fan of Blue Origin just because um, sending people to space for 11 minutes don't doesn't make them, you know, astronauts. Um, I, I read uh, the Elon Musk um, autobiography book and uh, I'm a huge fan <laughs> of Elon Musk. So I think that uh, his desire to reach the red planet one day um, is going to secure the crew by creating the most, the safest rockets. And I think that um, he won't risk the lives of, the lives of his crew that's why you know I... one thing i think is really interesting is a lot of a lot of people that become engineers grow up with an influence around them right so if you go back nearly a hundred years and you look at um you know henry ford wanting to invent the automobile mm -hmm. what he had to go on was that we had horse-drawn carriages how do we motorize the carriage right so he would he would try to look and see how do I make a future advancement to this? But as time went on, literature, pop culture, films, things started to evolve that gave people ideas. 
So there's a whole generation of engineers that grew up watching Star Trek. So a whole generation of engineers that watch Star Wars. There's a whole generation of people that watch 2001 A Space Odyssey. And they were like, how do we make that tech real? Because they loved what they were seeing, right? It couldn't have, it never didn't exist. Touch screens weren't exist, you know, communicators on your, you know, the Bluetooth, all this stuff didn't exist, but people mm -hmm. made it exist because they were inspired by it, by the idea. And I think yeah. that's really interesting. And what I love about Elon Musk is he was like, well, why can't we land a rocket? <laughs> you know, why can't we have an electric car? Like, I don't, like, so he made these advances happen by putting together teams to make the future that he grew up seeing. And it's like, why are we plateaued? I think that, you know, uh, NASA certainly, uh, you know, made leaps and bounds by putting a man on the moon. Like, that's a, that's a huge deal. There was a, an active space race. But when we got the space shuttle, that was what the future looked like, you know? And although the space shuttle was flawed in a lot of ways and didn't quite function like it was supposed to, it still was the future. You were seeing the future in, in nearly constant space travel. And I haven't seen that until Elon Musk again. Everything had kind of plateaued until Elon starts getting involved in this and is saying, you know, I'm going to land these rockets on the ground and reuse them. And I'm going to land them on a barge in the middle of the ocean. I'm going to show you how precise our tech can be. And it's exactly. incredible to see this stuff happen. I love it. And I think science fiction is really important to giving designers ideas. And also just Elon yeah. Musk, his sense of style. He made it look like the future, you know, <laughs> like he, yeah, he I, added that, you know. I'm really on the same page. I really think um, that Elon Musk is great. First of all, um, I think that he's the the richest person right here, uh, right there on Earth, you know, right now. Um, I remember when reading his book, um, he said that if he had the opportunity to create a special pill that he could, you know, get um, every day, that could. Um, give him all the vitamins, the calories, and let's say the water for the day, he would create that pill. Just because he thinks that eating and drinking water is a waste of time. Um, in order to be that risky and fearless and creative, you also have to be very smart and intelligent. Um, if you have goals, but you're not smart or intelligent or Patient, patient about them, um, you're not going to succeed and, you know, achieve them. But he is very intelligent. He studied very, very, very hard in order to create a company, create PayPal, then save it and invest all of his money in SpaceX. I, I really admire him. And speaking of science fiction movies that inspire people, do you have a favorite space movie, a favorite science fiction film. Can you repeat, please? Oh, I was saying, um, you know, speaking of like science fiction movies, do you have a favorite space movie? Do you have anything that you oh. like in science fiction? Yeah, sorry, the connection, the connection lag. Well, I really like one movie, it's called Proxima, and it's about a female astronaut from ESA. Um, she has a daughter and she prepares for a mission. Um, she is, you know, next to men and she has to compete with them. So I really like um, this movie, but also I really like the movie, The First Man about the Apple 11, Neil Armstrong. I really like um, The Martian as well, but I'm not a huge fan of the science fiction i really like science and the books i read as well are only science related or poet related sure i don't i don't know why i just uh, feel that the real science is better yeah what about a favorite planet or moon or star you have a favorite celestial body i really like titan that's uh, the moon of saturn um i actually named my bunny after <laughs> Titan, uh, because that's um, a celestial body that it's very likely to 
um, you know, have life on it just because. Um, is, it, is it volcanic? Is Titan volcanic? Um, it, there is um, met, um, methane. I'm not very sure how it's pronounced in English. Ethane and methane. <laughs> I, I'm not very sure if it's volcanic or not. I don't think so. Um, uh, there, re, there are many el elements in liquid form there, but uh, Europa, Titan, and Mars are the bodies that are most likely to, you know, become our home one day. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't remember if um, I'm actually go I'm going on to uh, Google right now to see. No. Okay. No. Um, instead of lava, their volcanoes may have spewed water, ice, hydrocarbons. Okay. I was thinking that Titan was volcanic, but I was wrong because there's like so many moons over there. Europa was always my favorite. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That was always mine. But I couldn't remember because, you know, first there's 12, then there's 50. There's, you know, it's like, I yeah, lose track. I can't even remember them all. I couldn't name them all anymore. But when I was, you know, 20, I could. I could name everything. Funny. Um, cool, cool. Let me ask you this. I want to get into something a little bit more philosophical. Okay. So I often wonder, uh, you know, my podcast, I always, you know, lean a little bit spiritual. I kind of try to mix science and spirituality in my podcast. Mm -hmm. And uh, anytime I, I talk to people in science they or in the medical field, we'll say, they tend to lean away from the idea of there being a God because they tend to want to explain stuff away. But I've also met a lot of people, met several astronauts that are incredibly spiritual and religious. Where do you fall in this spectrum? I mean, to me, it seems like when you see, you know, the, the epic that is space, how can you think there isn't a creator of all these things? But I'm curious how you feel about it. You know, how yeah. does, does God go with you in this type of journey from skydiving to potentially landing on Mars or does it not apply? Is it not necessary? Well, usually I don't think about it. I'm Christian, I'm Baptist, but I'm not religious. I do respect people that believe in God just because I believe in the power of the universe. I really think that there is something out there that helps me and sends me the right people at the right time. And, you know, signs, signals. I really think that I have a guardian angel, even though that I don't believe in God, but I read an article that I found very interesting. Um, many people, many scientists and astronauts believe in God because they couldn't prove that he doesn't exist. I, I cannot, you know, be sure that our universe um, is made only of particles and that there is only science out there. Um, I can't be sure about anything, you know? I think sure. that sure. everyone has, uh, you know, opinion about this. Uh, and I really don't wanna think about it just because I feel very lost when I start thinking about uh, the beginning of the universe and uh, the eventual and think of the universe. Sure. I, I think it's very egotistical of humans anyways to think they have it all figured out. <laughs> yeah. I definitely think that uh, there's a real arrogance surrounding science and that, hey, we got this on lock. You know, this is, we got it all figured out. Here it all is. And if we don't have the facts, we have the theory that's going to back everything up. And I think that's awfully small of us, really, considering the spec we are in the entire universe. And uh, let me ask you this. So life out there in the universe, there must be. Do you believe it? Do you, will there be? Will yeah, we find it? I, I, I believe in aliens. I believe in uh, life out there in the universe just because uh, we live on Earth. We're in the habitable zone of our system, you know, um, in our galaxy as well. I think that there are many other planet systems out there. Um, with other planets that are in their habitable zone. And also sometimes I do think some kind of, uh, you know, in this, this science fiction um, way when 
um, sometimes I imagine that there are different creatures out there that may not breathe, you know, air, but uh, may resist, let's say, um, different elements, for example, uh, different acids. Sure. Let's say. Neil deGrasse Tyson always says, you know, he says, I don't doubt that there's life out there in the universe, but don't expect it to look like us when you find it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> because yeah, it may exactly. just be a, an algae life form of some sort, you know, or some microbe that may not be humanoid in form. And he says, if we do find someone humanoid in form, they may likely have superior, more vastly superior technology <laughs> to mm -hmm. us. And we might need to be scared by that. Uh, so I always think it's interesting to hear what he has to say about it. Um, so you have, yeah. so you published a poetry book when you were 14, which is a very impressive to me. Um, and you have another book coming out. Tell me about that. Yeah. So when I was 14, I actually started writing poetry when, when I was seven years old. I was in second grade and all of uh, the years I was entering different competitions, you know, I won many awards and um, my family and I sat down and thought about the idea of publishing all my, you know, poetry in a book so I can reach um, more people. And yeah, when I was 14, actually, um, the premiere of my book was on the 11th of, this, of December. And uh, my 15th birthday was on the 12th of December. Um, so right now, yeah, I'm preparing my second book. It's called Once um, on a Blue Moon. That's great. Uh, um, yeah, I, I'm really inspired by space, but um, more, <laughs> I, I write more about love and um, I'm also inspired by natural disasters and uh, some natural phenomena. For example, I really write about um, the aurora, you know, the lights that appear, let's say, when you're in Iceland or in Russia. Yeah. Um, I write about dreams and about meteor showers. I really hope that one day my poetry will be translated in English. So right now I connected with the biggest um, agency. Um, it's not an agency, you know, it's a um, publisher. Pub yeah, publisher in uh, Bulgaria. Uh, so I can publish my book and sell it in um, bookstores. That's great. Now we're recording this podcast just before Christmas. And it yeah. will air at the end of January, early February. But you expect your next book would be out in 2022. Is that right? Yeah, I I really hope so. As I said, I'm having an exam. Uh, I'm having exams in January, and uh, the process of publishing a book is very complicated. Um, but I will say something that it's a secret. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> it's not going to be a secret anymore. Uh, but there will be 88 pages mm -hmm. because there are 88 constellations out there and for the number of each page there will be a constellation you know oh, that's, that's how i'm going to mark the page the number of the pages and also uh 10 of the pages in the between will be in different pastel colors with polaroid pictures that are related to the poems very cool and uh, the first 50, uh, you know, copies of the book will have a special card of the moon <laughs> that will be personal personalized for the buyers. Um, so it's going to be a complicated process and I really want to dedicate myself to it. That's why I'm not rushing the things. And I, I just really want to publish it by the end of next year. No, that sounds great. That sounds incredible. Maybe you can come back on and talk about it when it's ready to come out. Yeah, thank you so much. And hopefully you'll have your all your new certifications and uh, and we'll have a lot more to talk about. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Now, you're also a drummer. Tell me about that. Because yeah. if you're not doing enough already, <laughs> you're also a drummer. 
So like, what do you, do you are you in a band? Do you, are you a rock yeah, drummer? Was, like, what are you, what, tell me about that. Um, so when I was 10 years old, my father decided to bring me with him to this rock club in my hometown. And I don't know why I, I remember uh, taking a picture with every instrument, but I really fell in love with the drums. So I started playing the drums when I was in fifth grade. And uh, after that, when I was in seventh grade, I decided to, um, to come, took up lessons. Uh, I mean, I found a tutor and I started to uh, play and learn the notes. Um, but when I was in eighth grade, I found my first band and I played in three different bands. So I played rock and metal. <laughs> um, yeah, I performed songs of ACDC, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Slayer, Sepultura, and, uh, you know, other groups. But I also performed pop rock, uh, Maroon 5, um, U2, Amy Winehouse, Bulgarian songs. But we also had um, our own songs. I wrote the lyrics for the songs. And so we, we had many gigs, you know, in Bulgaria. Uh, we went to different competitions. It was really nice. I recorded my first cover last year of one of the songs of Five Finger Death Punch. That's uh, an American band that I really uh, enjoy listening to. Wow. So that's about the drums. Uh, they're a big part of my life. Um, my drums are right now in the capital city of Bulgaria because I live in uh, two places. Uh, you know, I go to college in Sofia, which is the capital of Bulgaria, but I live in Dobrich, that's my hometown. Uh, we are online right now because the situation in Bulgaria with the COVID-19 is very bad. We have yeah. many big cases. I think that we're in the first place of the worst cases in the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. It's funny when you talk about all the uh, the rock music that you like to you play drums to. I think to myself, oh, some of my favorite bands, and I think for you, that's the oldies. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's kind of funny, but uh, you actually have a couple of YouTube videos up that have you uh, playing drums, which I think is really cool. Also, um, you're skydiving on one of the videos. I've checked out your YouTube page yeah, to see the stuff I, that's on there. Uh, yeah, actually, my first skydive was uh, present for my graduation from my parents. And um, I also helped them with the money uh, because I really wanted to record it and, you know, save the moments. Uh, so there were people that were taking, uh, you know, shooting. <laughs> uh, they made the video and I decided to upload it to my YouTube channel. And also there is a special video that we recorded about my passion project for university where I sing, I play the drums, I scuba dive, skydive. It's a very interesting video. Uh, and yeah, I really want to start uploading more often. And I'm going to singing lessons as well. So I hope to release a singing cover soon. <laughs> wow. That'll be, what's it going to be of? Can you tell me? Well, right now um, I'm working on the song Easy On Me by Adele. <laughs> um but also so you, didn't, you didn't pick anything too hard to do <laughs> um right. no no I'm still uh in the beginning I'm a new singer I started very late I I decided to start lessons when I was 18 so it's uh very late for a singer to start you know but I'm really passionate about it so I hope to sure. become better one day how can people find you out there on the interwebs? Do you have a website? Are you on social media? Yeah, I use Instagram. I use YouTube. And I started to be more active on LinkedIn LinkedIn, because I, I think that there are more uh, professionals out there. So these are the platforms that are used. I also have a TikTok, but it's not related to space. It's more of a personal, you know, space. And I have a Facebook profile, but it's not a page. It's just a profile. So I use mainly Instagram, 
um, YouTube, LinkedIn, and I also have an email. My nickname is Astrochita, but I can also be found as Tatiana V. Ivanova. That's great. That's great. Tatiana, I really appreciate you uh, coming on to the Quest podcast and answering all my crazy weird questions. You are quite exceptional. You really oh. are. You're, you're quite, quite amazing for uh, a girl your age, what you want to do, your ambitions. It's always um, so hopeful to me to see a generation that wants to achieve the kinds of things you want to achieve. Gives me hope for the future, for sure. Thank you so much. The pleasure actually was mine. Uh, I really appreciate your time and your questions were amazing. Um, really, really amazing. I was um, very inspired by you and your podcast, actually. And um, thank you for the interesting questions and for the interesting conversation. Well, I think, I hope you come back. Um, it'd be great to just watch your progress go with all of this because it's it's quite amazing. And uh, there's a lot Thank of listeners you. out there for the Quest podcast. Go find her YouTube page, follow her on Instagram, make a donation to the cause, you know, like buy her <laughs> book, whatever you can do to keep pushing this girl forward because we got to get you on Mars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. For you. Thank you. Maybe there'll be a little metatomics patch on your uniform when you land as part of our corporate sponsorship. <laughs> our quest I, podcast say, logo. <laughs> yeah, I am. I'm going to share this podcast with everyone because it was an amazing experience for me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Well, I, I, I'm glad that you, uh, you came by today. So you take care. All my best. And let's talk soon. Okay. Yeah. Take Thank care. you. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. And there you have it. My interview with Tatiana Ivanova. What a remarkable teenager. I can't wait to have her back and see her progress and Let's all cross our fingers and hope and say a prayer that she makes it to Mars, because that would be incredible. Hope you enjoyed this podcast. I'll see you next time on Quest. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content.